Let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, under the general heading of Take Heed to Yourself, that you don't do your righteousness before men to be seen of men, because then you would have your reward. Jesus warned and demonstrated how people often give in such a way as it draws attention to themselves. The same is true as of prayer. And so he warned about prayer. Those that made a big public show. And how to pray to your father which sees in secret. And then Jesus gave to his disciples a model by which he gave to them the form that prayer should take. I do not believe that Jesus gave us a prayer that we were to memorize and to recite uh, by memory, but it's a, the model for prayer. It has the elements that prayer should have. And that true prayer does have the elements of prayer. It began with the address. Every prayer should have an address. And the address of the prayer is our Father, which art in heaven. And then it had the worship. Hallowed be not thy name. And then it has, as we enter in tonight, petition as intercession it's important that the first petition does not involve personal things but it involves the kingdom of God thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven a little further down in this sermon Jesus is going to say Don't worry about tomorrow, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. After these things, the heathen worry. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. So because our first thought should be for the kingdom of God, his righteousness. It is only appropriate and proper that the first interest in prayer should be the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God to come upon the earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth even as it is in heaven. As Christians, how we long for the kingdom of God to come. His will to be done here on earth. We yearn for the day that he will come and will set aside the kingdoms of this world. The day when they become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah And he begins to reign over the earth, his eternal reign. I feel much like Lot must have felt when he was living in Sodom. And we read concerning Lot that his righteous spirit was vexed daily by the way the people were living around him. And surely as we look at the world in which we live, Our righteous spirits are being vexed by the way people are living. My righteous spirit is vexed when I read of the proposed legislation here in the state of California, legislation that has already been adopted by some of the other states. And as I read of these things, I wonder God, don't they have any brains at all? Can't they see 
what's happening to our nation? Can't they see that the judgments of God are already beginning? Can't they see what's happening with the schools? And of course, again, even yesterday, we have this insanity. Can't they see what's happening as the result of the influence of the uh, media and the legislation that is coming forth? And my righteous spirit is vexed. And I find it very easy to pray, O oh Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth even as it is in heaven. And I find myself praying that more often and more desperately. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Obviously, from this petition, his will is not being done in earth as it is in heaven. It is so strange for me to think that men are constantly wanting to blame God for every tragedy and every calamity that comes along. And whenever some tragedy strikes, people usually say, well, why did God allow this? Not recognizing that Satan is in control of the world today. He is in rebellion against God and is leading the world in rebellion against God. And what we are seeing are the natural consequences of that rebellion. It is interesting that there are certain laws that God has established in nature. We have defined many of these laws. I don't know that we understand them, but we know that there are certain laws of nature. We know the law of gravity. We know how that mass attracts mass. But why it does, don't know. We know the law of magnetic power. We know the laws of electricity. We may not understand exactly how they work, but we know they do work, and we learn to obey them and to follow them. You don't go around sticking your finger in electric sockets because you know the law of electricity. And you don't go jumping off of tall buildings because you know the law of gravity. And knowing these laws, we know that there is in the laws a definite cause and effect. And we learn to respect that. But what people don't realize is that there are certain spiritual laws at work in our world today also. And to violate the spiritual laws can have as much a detrimental effect upon you as does violating the physical laws of our world. And what God warned in the law that God gave was warning men that if you do these things, you're going to have consequences that you'll have to pay by violating these laws. You cannot violate the spiritual laws of God and think that you're going to get off scot-free. And I believe that God, in giving his laws, knowing about the human body, knowing how the body functions, knowing how that he built in this immune system in our bodies to fight off foreign protein, foreign matter, that God warned against certain practices, knowing that it would break down the immune system because the body would be trying to fight so many foreign proteins, it would just break down the immune system. And you would have what we today call AIDS as the result 
of violating the laws of God. Just because we can't see as close a relationship between the cause and the effect of the spiritual laws as we do the physical laws, nonetheless, you violate the spiritual laws and you're going to pay the penalty. Now, God gave the law to protect you. But if you want to just ignore it, then you're going to suffer the consequences. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In this earth as it is in heaven. Right now we are sort of as aliens here. On this earth. We used to sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And we read concerning Abraham and the men and the women of the Old Testament how that they claimed that they were just strangers and pilgrims here. They were searching for the city which had foundation, whose maker and builder was God. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and said, the present scheme of things is rapidly passing away. Therefore, let your every contact with the world be as light as possible. Now, our task is to bring people into the kingdom of God. When Jesus called Paul to the preaching of the gospel, he said to deliver them from the power of Satan unto God, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. That's our personal mission. That's the mission of the church, to bring people out of the darkness into the light, out of the power of Satan into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is wherever God reigns. And if God reigns in your life, the kingdom of God is within you. It's wherever God reigns. And thus, when we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven, we are also praying for God's kingdom to come in our own heart, that we might yield to the lordship of Jesus Christ in all things. Lord, bring me into conformity with your will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is the first of the petitions. And a successful person is a person who has established proper priorities in their lives. And the right priority is, first things first, the main thing, the main thing. And the first thing is your relationship with God and the kingdom of God. The other things will be taken care of. Life moves or spins, you might say, on a vertical axis. That's that up and down vertical axis upon which our life revolves. My relationship with God. Now, there is the horizontal plane of my life. And that's my relationship with with those around me, my immediate family, my associates at work, and the people that I meet, my neighbors and all, this horizontal plane. Now, if the vertical axis is out of kilter, the horizontal plane, as it revolves on the axis, is going to be out of kilter. And you've met people whose lives are sort of like a yo-yo. They're up, they're down, they're up, they're down, and, and, and they're always trying to bring their life into balance. Every time you see them, they're in an endeavor of bringing their life into a balance, and, and, and they're struggling, and they'll tell you of their struggle as they're trying to get life sort of balanced out. And 
a lot of times they go to a psychologist who seeks to help them get their life into balance. And we'll put them on medication and so forth to help them sort of get things balanced. The problem with many psychologists is they only work on the horizontal level. The real problem lies on the vertical axis upon which the life revolves. When your life is out of kilter with God, it's going to be out of kilter with fellow men. When your life gets right with God, then things will be right with your fellow man. And so the real answer is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let the kingdom of God come into your life. Get into a right relationship with God and these other relationships will come into balance. It's just that simple. But you have to set the priority. My top priority is my relationship with God. I want to make sure that that is all that it should be, that the vertical axis of my life is right. Because then the horizontal plane will be right. Moses said to the children of Israel, Set your hearts unto all of the words which I have testified to you this day, and you shall command your children to observe and to do all of the words of this law. And Moses basically said, It's not an option. It is your life. God has established the rules. If I'm following the rules that God has established, I am living in the kingdom of God, under the authority of God. Now, having begun the petitions with the intercession of praying for his kingdom, Jesus then leads us into personal petition. Give us this day, our daily bread. Our sustenance is very important. We need the daily bread in order to survive. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with bringing your own personal needs to the Lord in prayer. Jesus went on to say, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, it must be that Jesus considered this one of the most important petitions in the prayer. Because of all of the things in the prayer, when he came to the end of the prayer, there was only one aspect of the prayer that he stopped to sort of reinforce. And that was this petition, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And at the end of the prayer, Jesus said, for if you do not forgive men their trespasses against you, neither will your father forgive your trespasses against him. This has created a problem in the minds of many people because it would appear from what Jesus is saying here that our forgiveness is really dependent upon our forgiving. Now, you will notice three times here in the Sermon on the Mount the graces that we receive from God are predicated upon our willing to bestow those graces on others. In chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The mercy of giving mercy or showing mercy opens the door for me to receive mercy. In chapter 7, verse 2, Jesus said, 
For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. We'll look at this more fully when we get to the seventh chapter. But basically, Jesus is saying that you are setting the standards by which you will be judged. In whatever measure you meet out, that's the measure that will be meted back to you. You set the standards for how God is going to judge you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. People wonder why I'm so merciful. I need mercy. (laughs) Now, is this so? Jesus gave several messages on the importance of forgiving. You remember that parable in Matthew chapter 18 concerning the wicked servant. The parable followed a question by Peter. Verse 21, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often... Shall I forgive my brother a sin against me? Seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Forgiveness is not a matter of mathematics. It's a matter of spirit. But this prompted then this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents, or roughly $16 million. And inasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, in order that a payment might be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and he freed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. And that hundred pence, uh, incidentally, is about, uh, oh, uh, $160. And... He had him cast into the debtor's prison till the debt was paid. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, those fellow servants, they were very hurt. And they came and told their Lord all that was done. Then the Lord, after he had called him in, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant even as I have pity on you. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. And so likewise, here's the thrust now, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. I think that Jesus has made it very clear and very plain. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If I want forgiveness, it's important that I be forgiving. I am a servant. Let me tell you what, God has forgiven me a great debt a debt that I could never pay. But God has freely forgiven me. Thus, who am I to hold a grievance against someone who has 
wronged me, someone who has maybe snubbed me, or someone who has taken advantage of me and has defrauded me. When God has forgiven me so great a debt, he wants me to be forgiving. And so it is included in this prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, Jesus said, when you stand praying, forgive. It's interesting. Forgiveness is a very important part of prayer. When you're praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, so if you're praying and someone comes to your mind, they, ooh, I hate them. The Lord says, forgive. If you have ought against any. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, Jesus, it seems, is making this very clear and quite plain. That forgiveness is an important issue with the child of God. In Luke 17, Jesus said, Take heed to yourself, verse 3, If your brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in the day, he turns again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. It's pretty strong. Then comes this interesting petition that is a real enigma to many people, where Jesus included in the prayer, Lead us not into temptation. What makes this a difficult petition and has created a lot of questions is the fact that we know that God doesn't lead us into temptation. James tells us, Let no man, when he is tempted, say that God tempted me. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither tempteth he any man. Now, temptation usually follows this pattern. First, it begins with a simple thought of evil. And then, there is the dwelling on the thought beginning to fantasize. Third, it begins to delight in the thought and begins to scheme and figure out how it might fulfill the desires that are there. And the fourth is that decision to go ahead and fulfill the desire. That's where sin comes in. It begins in our minds. Lead us not into temptation. God, keep my mind clear and clean from these things that I don't dwell on them. Now, you can't help them entering, it would seem. There are so many things by which we are surrounded every day. And, and it's getting worse. If you look at television for any length of time, even the news, when the uh, commercials come on, they are using sex so much in the commercials. In reading through the newspapers, the ads for these major department stores advertising their lingerie and, you know, half-clad women or 
not even half clad. Uh, and modeling the, the, the various, and, and it's, it's there, you go through the, you see it, but what do you do? Do you dwell on it? Do you think, oh my, you know, she's attractive. Or do you just immediately dismiss it out of your mind? Not be drawn into it. Lord, don't let me be drawn into these things. Don't let my mind pick them up and begin to lust or desire them and begin to fantasize over them and begin to plan on how I can fulfill the desires of my flesh. And and I think that that's what the petition is. Lord, keep me from dwelling on these things, the temptations that are all around me. Keep me, Lord, from these things. Don't lead me into that second, third phase. But let me free my mind from these things. The Bible tells us, bringing every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Jesus Christ. And we have to do that. We can't dwell on these things. We've got to bring the thoughts into captivity unto Jesus Christ. The word temptation, this particular word, has sometimes been translated sore trials. Thus, this petition would be Lead us not into sore trials, but deliver us from the evil one. When we think of sore trials, we are bound to think of Job, where God gave to Satan the liberty to put him to the ultimate test. Lord, don't put me to the ultimate test. Lead me not into these sore trials, but deliver me from the evil one who would like to put me to the test, to the limits. It was Satan that was seeking from God the permission to attack Job. Complaining that God had a hedge around him. Lord, keep the hedge around me. Lead me not into sore trials. I don't want my life to be a testing ground like Job's. Now, we have the promise that there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. The faithfulness of God, he knows your limits better than you do. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Lord, lead me not into these sore trials or into these temptations that go beyond my capacities. Now, I would like to suggest another Possible meaning. The great tribulation that is coming upon the earth. Jesus spoke about it in Luke 21. Some of the horrifying events that will take place in the great tribulation. And as he spoke of these events of the great tribulation, Jesus said, pray ye always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, I told you to pray that, that you'll be accounted worthy to escape this great tribulation period. And to stand before the Son of Man. In the messages of Jesus to the seven churches in Revelation, 
In chapter 3, as he addresses the church of Philadelphia, he said, Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation which is coming to try men who dwell upon the earth. The great tribulation period is called the hour of temptation. Thus the petition, lead us not into temptation with the, dec- or with the exhortation of Jesus in Luke 21, pray ye always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things of the great tribulation. It could be that that is the prayer that Jesus is suggesting here. Lord, don't want to go through the great tribulation. Pray ye always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the earth. And thus the lead us not into temptation could be that very prayer, Lord, let me be accounted worthy to escape the great tribulation. Having dealt with these personal petitions, Jesus leads us in prayer back to worship. It began with worship, and he brings us back to worship. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So beginning with worship, going through intercession, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Moving into personal petition, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses and so forth. Ending up again with worship. Those are the three basic forms that prayer takes. Worship, intercession, and personal petition. And prayer should involve all three. Worship is prayer. Worshiping the Lord. Thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. The worship, that's prayer. Intercession. Where I'm praying not for just my own personal needs. Interceding for our city. Interceding for our state. Interceding for our community. Interceding for our schools. Interceding for the church. Interceding for our missionaries. Intercession, a very important part of prayer. That's, that's sort of where real spiritual warfare is involved in the intercession. And then petition. This last portion, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever, is not in some of the old manuscripts. Basically, the manuscripts that come from uh, Alexandrian uh, manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and so forth. And because this final worship does not appear in a few of the old manuscripts, and especially those from Egypt, you do not find this in the Douay version of the Bible, the Catholic Bible, because the Douay version was pretty much a translation from the Vaticanus. And uh, thus uh, it was and is omitted from the Catholic Bible. It is also omitted from some of the modern translations or it is put in sort of a brackets as though it is, you know, questionable as to whether or not it really belongs in the text. But in the vast majority of the ancient text and in the uh, writings of the early church fathers, Uh, Many of them include this, Thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. 
And so I believe that it does belong there. I'm not a fan of the Alexandrian or Sinaiticus text, but am more towards the uh, majority text or the received text. And I think that it is very proper. I, I think that it is a beautiful ending to the prayer, the acknowledging again. You see, we began with our Father which art in heaven, the one that we're addressing. Hallowed be thy name, the worship of him. And coming back again, thine is the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thine is the kingdom. And the power. Again, it is focusing on God and his greatness. I brought him some petitions. I brought him some needs. I might be overwhelmed by my needs. I might be overwhelmed by the whole processes that are going on. And to be frank with you, I am overwhelmed by the power of the media and the control the media has and the filth that the media is, is pouring out on our nation. And I'm, I'm overwhelmed by that. I'm sort of of those that will be saying, who can make war with the beast? And, and we see the powers of the beast, the Antichrist, in, in our world today. And you wonder, who in the world can fight these forces? You see the control of the government by the liberals, and you think, who can make war with the beast? And you're overwhelmed. And thus it's good at the beginning of your prayer to focus on the greatness of God. The powers of God. And it, to conclude your prayer with again reminding, thine is the kingdom. Lord, overall, you're in control. Yours is the power. Powers of darkness are nothing, Lord, compared with you. Yours is the glory forever. Amen. Beautiful model for prayer. And, and I recommend that you follow it as a model. Not verbatim, necessarily. But follow it as a model. And at times... If you want to repeat it verbatim, don't just rattle it off. But go through slowly on each phrase and meditate on each phrase. Take at least a half hour in going through this prayer. In meditation on each phrase of the prayer until it really soaks in and, and it comes from your heart to the Lord. Under this same section of be careful that you don't do your righteousness before men to be seen of men, there's one more aspect of righteousness that Jesus is going to deal with and that's in fasting. And in our next study we will Study the subject of fasting. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we can come to you with our needs and with our petitions. And when we realize, Lord, that you've created the heavens, the universe, the earth, every life form that is in it, when we realize, Lord, the greatness, the magnitude of your power, Lord, we realize that it's really nothing for you to help us. You're so great. You're so powerful. It doesn't take away from you at all, Lord. And these issues that are so big to us, so overwhelming. <laughs> Lord, they're so simple for you. And so help us, Lord, to keep focused 
upon you. And bring our request, our petitions, knowing, Lord, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we would ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Henceforth you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and there it's intensive in the Greek, which would be, please ask that you might receive, that your joy might be full. Please ask. Imagine the Lord pleading for you to ask him. Please ask. Let's stand. The pastors are down here in the front this evening to pray for you. Please ask (laughs) that you might receive, that your joy might be full. James said, you have not because you ask not. And many times it's just that simple. Oh, what needless pain we bear, the song goes. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so whatever need you might have this evening, God is able to meet that need. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. And the pastors are down here to pray for you. So as soon as we're dismissed, come on forward, you that are in need of prayer. And they'll be more than happy to Bear your burden with you and so fulfill the law of Christ. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are why you died. On Calvary, your touch is what I long for. You have given You have given life to me. God bless you. This is the end of this message. If you would like further information on any of our products or to receive our free catalog, contact The Word for Today. The address is P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. Or you may reach us by our toll-free number, 1-800-272-WORD. That's 1-800-272-WORD.